So Elba is one years old and for her birthday I decided it is time to share her birth story. The reason I thought it would be beautiful to share it on her birthday is because prior to birthing I read the book Gentle Birthing, Gentle Mothering and in that book she shares that on her children's birthday she speaks about their birth stories and she speaks about it in terms of what it is to her on that birthday. So it's not about getting the exact time of everything perfectly correct. It's speaking about how you're remembering it, but in the moment that you are now. So that's what today's video is going to be for me. Of course, I will share certain details like times things happen and I have recordings of that. So that's why I can share that accurately. But the actual telling of the story is going to be as I remember that now. And the reason that I've wanted to do it this way is because I definitely did not want to tell this story postpartum, like newly postpartum. I believe that the initial postpartum period is so sacred and so you're so vulnerable and you're still very open. And it's just not a time that I wanted to share such a, I want to say raw, like transformative biggest <laughs> event of my life story. I wanted time to process that on my own as well as to speak through it many times with loads of people. Depending on when I spoke to you about my birth story, some of the ways that I felt about certain things might have shifted as I've gone through thinking about it and processing it. And here we are a year later, I feel that I've spoken about it extensively. I've kind of processed whatever I needed to process and I am feeling ready to share it. Right, quick disclaimer for today's video. This is a birth story, so I'm gonna share a lot of very real, intimate details about bodily things that happen in birth. If that gives you the freakies, this video is probably not for you. There's gonna be a lot of that. The other disclaimer is, well, it's not really a disclaimer, it's just to women who may be watching this while in pregnancy and while preparing for birth. I think that it's very important to protect your space, protect how you feel leading up to birth. So I'm going to be sharing raw details about my birth, things that were really, really intense, really challenging, really tough. But all in all, for me, this was a very positive experience. Right now, having said that, let's get into it. Right, so at 40 weeks and four days, and this is important, I base that on the calculation of ovulation and then go back two weeks, not the date of my last period. That would have made it to be inaccurate by four days. Now, four days doesn't seem like a big deal to anybody, but it was a big deal to me because I had a planned home birth supported by midwives through the state of Alberta. And I really wanted them to support me in my home birth and they had certain parameters for doing that. So with that, they said to me, if you reach 41 weeks and you still haven't gone into labor, we're gonna kindly ask that you go for ultrasounds every three days. Because I had declined all forms of induction or anything to kind of speed up labor, including any membrane sweeps. So no membrane sweeps. And I was like, I agreed to go for the ultrasounds, but I mean, I really, I didn't want to, especially not being that pregnant. So it makes a difference. The fact that I was 40 weeks and four days, <laughs> right? So 40 weeks, four days. When I woke up that morning, I mean, my sleep was not great at that point. I could feel that my cervix was more open and I didn't do a physical <laughs> cervical check to feel that it was more open. I mean, I've been tracking my cycle for so long. I could literally just physically feel it's there's opening now where in pregnancy, your cervix is closed for the like entire duration of pregnancy, except leading up to birth with that more opening. I mean, I was literally sitting around waiting for some signs of labor up until that point. I had nothing like there was nothing telling me that labor was going to start soon. I literally felt like I was going to be pregnant forever. So thankfully I started to feel that opening. And then when I went to the bathroom, I saw that my mucus plug had started to come loose. I personally hate the word mucus plug or mucus, but that is what it is called. So that's the kind of plug between the vaginal canal and the uterus. That's nice and close throughout pregnancy to protect baby. 
So that started to come loose from 6.30 in the morning. And then throughout that day, it was sort of coming loose in bits and pieces. It was more of a clear fluid at that time. Well, mucus it was more viscous than pure fluid with kind of tinges, but I hadn't seen the typical bloody show just yet. So leading up to birth, I had made a birth group. It was a WhatsApp group of people who would be my sort of virtual village, my support group, my, you know, I don't know how else to phrase it, like my, my people for my birthing experience. So these were people who are either just very close to me, it was women only, and people who had really expressed an interest in my birth or in, you know, birth in general, but close to me. And the idea of the group were that they would be the typical kind of tribe that you would have, but from like virtually, because I mean, I had moved to Canada recently before my birth. So the idea with this birth group was that if I needed, I don't know, support, encouragement, thoughts, prayers, you name it, that this would, would be the space. So we were all kind of waiting for labor to start. And now that my mucus plug had started coming loose, I shared on the group, like, we're finally seeing some signs of labor on the horizon. So the excitement in the group really picked up. That was awesome. We had discussions around snowstorms bringing babies, as well as it was a new moon. So the snowstorm discussion was funny because, I mean, it was literally February in Calgary, Canada. So there was a snowstorm. Right, then nothing else much happened. I mean, I had like menstrual cramp or menstrual cramping, but you know, nothing major throughout that day. I was obviously very excited, very nervous, because this was the moment that I had been planning for like so long and waiting for. And I just had no idea how the experience was gonna go. Just a whole lot of nerves and excitement and then trying to still be like okay you know this might take really long like let's not get too excited let's rest up let's try go about life as per usual then around midnight i had what is typically referred to as the bloody show so a bunch of bleeding i shared this on my birth group and the intensity of the menstrual type cramps had picked up this was amazing so part of the birth group was that everybody had some kind of candle or some kind of light that they would turn on or light up when labor started. And this would, would be the kind of virtual portal to me and ways that we would be connected virtually through this, this type of light. So everybody was sending pictures of their candles or the light that they chose and why they chose it and sending through like their thoughts, their prayers, their wishes. I'm literally getting goosebumps just like thinking about the messages that I received. I've never read them like so many times uh, since then. So I felt this like nervousness, excitement, and, and my feelings were definitely reflected in the group, which was amazing, but I had this sense to manage expectations, my own and other people's. So I wanted to be like, hey, listen, you know, this could take really long. Uh, it could be a couple of days like you might have to turn your candles off and put them back on and so forth so i didn't want to dampen the excitement and what a big deal this is but also be like managing i guess my own expectations and then and then there so i did share that in the group but i think we were all just like really excited and, and not excited might not be the right word like a lot of anticipation and just like this is the moment it's happening Okay, so after the bloody show, I tried to sleep a bit. Ugh, I mean, realistically, I wasn't getting that much sleep at the end of my pregnancy anyway, but definitely less so now with the emotional excitement and also like the physical discomforts and the intensity was picking up. So try to get some rest because you, you don't know how much rest you're gonna get after that. But I can't say I got much. Then I woke up for the day and I, I mean, I would describe it as contractions, but yeah, it was a whole lot of feels and they were picking up with intensity and it was, it was quite intense. So I figured, okay, you know, fine. I'm gonna just go about the day. I had, I think on the previous day or, or the day before that, purchased more blankets from the thrift store and more 
towels from the thrift store for our home birth. So I decided, okay, let's wash those, make sure they're ready. So I finished up washing that and it was really hard to just go about my day. I was feeling quite like this is very physically intense, much more than I had heard from other people's stories. So I was a bit like, you know, do I just feel this more intensely than they do? Like, how is everybody able to like bake a birth cake and just go about their day? Like, this is really hard for me. <laughs> so I was a bit like, ugh, this is intense. I also think, um, the difficulty that I had was I was expecting like contractions, like, you know, like that. And I was not experiencing that. I was experiencing a whole lot of waves of backache, you know, which are contractions, but they were in my back. They weren't uh, what I would be used to. So that was indicating to me that, you know, baby was probably not in the ideal position at that point. And I did have a birth book that I made, like a file where I included information on various positions to try if you're having back labor to help shift baby into a better position. So I did a couple of those from the book. I had attended like a physio session before I moved to Canada where she also like sent me a couple of things to do if it's in a difficult position. So I tried to implement that. Kind of jumping around here, but order of events for that day. Try to do the washing at around noon. Ian sent a photo on our birth group to say, I'm getting a bit of rest to put of me napping. And our doula said that, you know, typically she'd come for tea just to be there through the starting of labor, but because it was a snowstorm, like she's not gonna come for tea. Fair enough, you know, there was a lot of snow outside. As the back intensity increased, I realized it was important to do something about that. That's when I moved to doing the exercises from my book. Some of them, Ian came downstairs to help me. He was working from home. It's like pulling the leg while lying sideways, doing some like glute shift kind of things with the movements, trying to like tilt my pelvis and literally like try to move baby to go forward. With one of the movements, there was a bit of like a, I wanna say like a bit of a popping and then some water that came out. So I was kind of expecting, okay, my water might break soon, but everything that I had read and most stories that I'd read, it doesn't actually break like in the movies, like whoosh, it kind of like trickles here and there comes out in bits and pieces. So I wasn't really expecting it to be this like major event in my birth story. I was like, okay, it's probably just gonna come out in bits and pieces. Then I went upstairs, I was doing something. Thankfully I was standing next to the linen closet, but there was a like and just water. So because it was next to the linen closet, I literally grabbed the towels and the absorbent pads that we had bought for birth and threw them down and kind of just like sat down while it was like and there was no mistaking that that was my water breaking because it literally went through everything it went through my underwear the pad that i was wearing through my clothing and soaked up I think, like an entire towel so I love the picture, I'm gonna share it, that Ian sent because he was in the bathroom and you know made sounds to indicate something was happening. So he opened the door and there was me, like at that point I had taken off my pants, kind of sitting there being like, definitely my water just broke. All right, so that was good timing because that was 10 minutes to five in the afternoon on 40 weeks and five days pregnant. Good timing because that meant that Ian had finished his work day and he could now go shovel the, the pathway to make sure that the people can get there if they need to come assist for labor and then also just be with me. I texted the midwife just to let her know like my water had broken. She responded saying that, okay, given that you're not having regular contractions yet, it's probably because of the positioning, you should try doing the mild circuit. And then she told me to page her if I'm at 311 and then also to let her know if by the next morning I still wasn't having regular contractions. And then she asked me to take my temperature and to let her know if it was above 37.5 degrees. Honestly, I don't think I took my temperature at all during labor. I didn't remember to do that. But I did go downstairs to do the mild circuit. This was also a recommendation from a friend of mine who was supporting from afar who said that that helped her so i was like okay you know let's do the mile circuit i found a youtube video that is like the actual mile circuit like she does it with you and i put that on and i tried to do it i hated it 
it was really hard for me to do. Like, I thought that it would be like a whole lot of movements, you know, keeping me busy. But it wasn't. It was like one movement that you hold and I got tired and it was intense. And the intensity was picking up, but I still couldn't say that I was like having super regular contractions because the intensity was this waves of backache. <laughs> <laughs> like that's all I can describe it as. So that was pretty tough to also time because you know you want to time it you hard because it's like these erratic waves of intense back pain. All right, so that was two hours after my water had broken and things were getting really intense. So a little while after that, I asked on my birth some good energy, some good vibes because it was so intense and I was so confused because I had really prepared like a lot for birth and I didn't expect it to be so intense so quickly. I expected to go a long time with like, you know, slow contractions and then picking up, but this was feeling really intense and very confusing because the intensity was in my back. We tried to time the contractions. I got a contraction timer that doesn't have the whole alert to go to the hospital because I'd read and heard that that's really irritating when you're having a home birth, but it was, yeah, it was hard to do that. So then I went upstairs to have a bath in our normal tub to just try help with the intensity. And it did help, but it also seemed to slow things down. Then my midwife had messaged me to check if they had regular contractions yet or not. And I said, not really. I told the midwife that I took a bath and she then said she doesn't recommend that I do that until I'm in active labor because of the concerns around infection. And that was a real difficult tea for me. I've been and even chosen to use like our upstairs bath as opposed to the birth pool that I'd rented. It was it was hard for me because I didn't know where the heck I was in labor. And I know actually most people don't know, but stories that I'd read, stories that I'd heard, people had more or less an idea because there was kind of like a consistent picking up of things where mine was so intense so quickly and I was really concerned about how am I going to keep doing this? Like, this is so intense. Like, I am I'm becoming quite tired and I, I don't see how I'd be able to do this for many, many more hours, maybe even days. Because a lot of people told me that your first labor can be really long and, and stretch over a couple of days. So my fear the whole time was if it's so intense now, how am I going to continue to do this? So fine, I got out the bath. The midwife also suggested that I do stairs to help with the positioning, walking up and down them sideways. So I tried that as well. And Anne kept wanting to call our doula and I kept saying no because I don't want to waste her time. Like I don't want her to come until like I'm in active labor, but it was really intense. And I think he was also really concerned about not being able to support me as much as I needed. And I think we were both very confused about how intense the experience was for me. But I was so hesitant to call the doula because I kept thinking like, it's still gonna be really, really long. And I don't want her to come all the way in a snowstorm and then have to just leave again and come back and leave again. But eventually with how intense things were, I finally just said, okay, fine. You know, I'm, I'm gonna ask her to come over. And the whole time she had been very supportive. She said, look, you don't have to be in active labor for me to come like I can come and just help you with this part of labor like let me know if you need me to come and I I was the one who was resistant to this so eventually I did say you know what actually please can you come like it's it's pretty intense this whole time I really appreciated the super super powerful messages that I was getting on the birth group like can't describe like they were amazing at the time I wasn't really up for reading them so Ian was like reading them to me but I I just really appreciated it was this perfect thing of having support and having people you know be there for me but not be in my space so i still had the privacy that i believe is necessary for labor and birth so that's also why i had a home birth is because that's where i feel safe that's where i feel like i can be vulnerable and 
do whatever I need to do. So our doula arrived at 20 yeah. minutes past 11 at night. There's a couple of pictures. Ian updated the birth group that she had arrived. I think they were pretty relieved to know that now had additional support. Because she could now be with me, Ian decided he was gonna fill up the birth pool. So he was doing that and she was supporting me. Various typical things that you do to kind of help with the intensity of contractions, but not a lot of it was helpful for me to be honest just because it was in my back so i tried sitting on the birth ball i hated that like it was an awful feeling felt like i was sitting on the baby's head and oh no didn't like that at all so we thought like what would have been really helpful for the type of experience i was having would be like one of those birth chairs obviously we didn't have that so we tried to use like a squatty potty because it's got a the circular part there where you can be sitting but you're not like sitting on where the pressure is but yeah also i didn't i didn't like that so i think the only thing that really helped me during those waves of intensity was like a flaxseed heated bag on my back that i thought was a bit helpful and then we had this like interesting little massage thing that i'd gotten with like a labor kit that was all right too but other than that not much. It was also really still difficult to time the contractions because they were not like consistent Yay. times at all. They were not consistently apart, but there was a whole lot of intensity. Our doula was great in reminding us like, cause I was so confused about where I was in labor, to be honest. Like I thought we were still at the beginning parts because everything was happening really quickly and it felt really intense, but like I, always you know expected labor is going to take really long so i thought we we're still in the beginning phases so the candle that i had going was an energy candle not like a surrendering candle but our doula reminded us to set the scene so she was like let's get this fairy lights up let's dim the lights let's get it nice in here and that was great so then we had a really nice vibe going and i did feel like i could laugh in between the intensity of it and smile and yes it was still intense but it was it it was a nice atmosphere okay so the birth pool was getting filled up which was fine because we had a water heater as well if we needed to keep the, the water warm but kind of shortly after our doula arrived watching me seeing how intense things were seeing the contractions she said to me listen I think you're at 311 if you want to tell your midwife. The best 311 guess we could do because it was a bit all over the place. And I couldn't use the affirmations of like, you can do anything for a minute because mine weren't a minute. They were sometimes like three minutes. And so I had no like, just get through this one, just make it through this one. Cause it was like, sometimes it would just be so long and so intense. And it is so hectic, so hectic. Anyway. So we called the midwife on the pager. So remember our doula arrived at 20 past 11. And then our midwife arrived at just after midnight. So at this point, things were obviously even more intense. I keep saying they were intense, but they were just like increasing in intensity. With our midwife, I just wanna kind of say this for an understanding. There was a midwife shortage in Alberta and because it's also through the state, I couldn't really pick my midwives. That's not criticism to them or anything. They were on the younger side. I think it was their first year of practicing, lovely. And then you get whoever is on call at that point. So because my midwives were on the younger side, younger in terms of having practiced, and I felt that I needed maybe someone in my birthing space who had really like experienced a lot, a lot of births and had a lot of trust in the, the physiological process of birth. That's why we got the doula we did. And our doula has also attended free births. So I felt very comfortable with that because obviously birthing in Calgary in winter, there might've been a chance that the midwife didn't get to me in time. So that's also why I wanted a doula who felt really comfortable that should a midwife not be present, she would still feel very comfortable. So that being said, my midwife arrived just after midnight and afterwards, you know, Ian and the doula said to me, but this is a big thing that Ian remarks when he talks about our birth story, is that the entire atmosphere changed when the midwife arrived. Before that, it was, you know, yes, it was intense, but it was very peaceful. There were lots of laughs. It was, it was good. Once she'd arrived, it became more cold, more clinical, more to the point. 
of like, okay, this is happening. What's this, you know, very instruction based. That was fine. Just go along with it, I guess. And then she asked if she could do a cervical check. Prior to birth, I'd made a lot of decisions prior to birth and a lot of thinking about like what I would want, what I wouldn't want, and the things that I want, want to say no to. So prior to birth, when it came to things like cervical checks, for me, that was a no. And the reason I say no is because I think that is quite like invasive into your, your birth space when you're doing it. So the other reason I didn't want to have a cervical check is because I don't think that they're accurate or useful when you're in labor. And yes, I know about the whole pattern that people consider that might happen in labor, but all of the birth stories and all of the people I've spoken to, they went from like a very low number to like giving birth shortly thereafter, or their cervix was very dilated, but then they still carried on for like super long after that. So I didn't want to do this thing in labor that I didn't think gave me a lot of value in terms of information. But nonetheless, when the midwife was asking about the cervical check, even though I know that they're not the most useful piece of information for me, obviously other people might feel differently. I was, this whole time I've explained this, like really in a state of confusion at how intense things were and i was almost like frustrated at how intense it was but yet i'm not in so-called active labor or this might still carry on for like another day or two so out of a space of that confusion and i guess curiosity of just wanting to understand because still i was just having these intense backache as my contractions and they they didn't have a proper pattern so i agreed to the cervical check so i lay down on our couch and honestly it it was the biggest regret of my entire birthing experience was agreeing to the cervical check lying down in that position was so painful it was really unbearably painful and then having the cervical check be done was also very painful and it carried on much longer than it typically would because i kept having these contractions in between and not lying still and it was just yeah i hated it so the midwife was trying to do the best that she could in terms of checking my cervix but eventually she was done and i like it was an awful experience for me without even hearing how much i was dilated she kind of announced okay you're only if i have to say something because it was hard for her to do the, the measurement i'd say you're around four centimeters dilated which is obviously not very far hearing that I had a mixture of like despondence, confusion, anger, and also just like a lot of anger that I lay down and experienced that incredible pain on top of like other intensity I was experiencing only to hear like apparently only four centimeters dilated. So the midwife announced, okay, like it's probably gonna be really long still, so she's gonna go and then she'll come back later when I'm in active labor. Again, this whole like when you're in active labor thing was really getting to me because I was feeling this so much intensity and I had kept doubting myself as to what I was experiencing because of the external noise, because of one, the stories of like, oh, a first labor usually takes really long and how other people's stuff progressed. And then also a midwife continuously reiterating that I'm not in active labor. So this was very difficult for me because what I was experiencing was so intense that I was like, how is this not active labor? Like, what? why is it so intense then? But that didn't help my mood, to be honest. I was in a pretty miserable mood at that point, but the midwife was like, okay, I'm gonna leave some equipment here because it was frozen. So it needed time to defrost and she's gonna go and, and we should call her back when I'm at 311. She left, she left sometime, I think like 20 minutes to one or something. So once she had left, our doula offered some reassurance because she could obviously see what I was experiencing. And she said, listen, like she, she could have been wrong in that measurement, but also the way that the atmosphere changed when she arrived, it could have been that labor then regressed and that my cervix felt like it didn't want to birth 
with like the way that that things had changed because really the atmosphere did change when the midwife arrived so i was like okay fine that information from the the doula kind of made me get into a mindset of not being a victim to this but like you know what whatever if i need to like deal with this intensity for another day or however long that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do it my way. And my way is to have water be the thing that helps me. So whenever in my life I've experienced intensity or pain, my go-to is water. To, to submerge my body in water feels really good for me. So I was also really angry at the whole, you know, you're not in active labor, so therefore I don't recommend that you get in water because of the infection thing. Because I wanted to use water to aid in my labor. So I was like, you know what? That's fine. I'm just going to risk it with the infection because it's clean water that I'm using and the risk of infection is pretty low and I need to find a way to get through this intensity. So because I was like, you know what, if I'm not in active labor, I'm not gonna use our birth pool, which was ready and beautiful and probably should have, but I didn't. I went upstairs to our tub that's upstairs to not use the birth pool. And as I was walking up the stairs, suddenly my body pushed and it was undeniably, my body was pushing. So I remember I'm just, I've just heard that I'm only at four centimeters and it's still gonna be really long and all of that. And here my body is starting to push. So I continued on my mission up to the tub, got in the tub, didn't put that much water. Ian and the doula crammed in there. She was, we were trying to make it nice and dim with lighting, like maybe put on a little candle or something. And I'm saying, you know, like my body's pushing and it was so intense and I, was, I wasn't leaning into those pushes at all. I, I was more resisting them because, you know, what is, what even is happening right now? But the doula was saying like, look, if this baby's gonna be born in water, it needs to be born in water. Like you need more water in the tub. And we were just kind of talking about like strategy, I guess. And it was funny because this really is not a big bathroom and this is not a space where I wanted to birth because it's, it's small. So that's why we've got a birth pool for downstairs. But yeah, my, my body just kept, pushing and the doula said look if you want the midwife here when your baby's born you probably should call her back and at that point i was obviously like not all that excited to call the midwife back but it was just you know i part of the plan was to have a midwife present there so i asked ian to kindly please call her back so he stepped out of the bathroom but i could still hear the call where he called her back and for sure she didn't sound all that thrilled to come back and a bit reluctant because I think in her mind I wasn't as as in labor as what we were telling her I was but nonetheless she was really nice and she agreed to come back that was literally 10 minutes after she had left that my body had started pushing and we called her to come back because my body was pushing I was like okay you know what I'm not going to take the time to fill up this tub now because if this baby is going to come now, you want there to be enough water so that they're not half like in air, half in water. So if they're going to be born in water, you want it like full submersion in water, which this tub was not. So found a way to make it down the stairs with every now and again my body pushing. So at this point I was still experiencing the, the back pain, but now my body was pushing as well. And I was kind of resisting the pushing and not leaning into it at all. Because again, my mindset was like, where am I in labor? But I got into our birth pool and that really helped me a lot. I, I felt good to be in our birth pool because it was nice and deep and I was very comfortable in there. Then the midwife arrived and she did a check with the Doppler. And now, if you're not familiar with my story, I did have four pregnancy losses prior to this pregnancy. So there was a lot of prep around fears, feelings of that stuff that come up. And I mean, of course, like a lot of birth prep is just fear in general, even if you haven't had pregnancy losses. But mine, there was like that extra element of having experienced that. So before she put the Doppler to my stomach, the doula said to me, and I swear this was one of the most reassuring things somebody could have said to me. And it was one of the most meaningful things in my birthing experience. She said to me, look, she's going to struggle to find the heartbeat because baby's going to be very low. Don't worry, like it might just take a little bit of time to find it. And that was insanely, like I literally got goosebumps as I said that because it was just what I, I needed to hear that in that moment because she did, she did struggle to find it. And she found the heartbeat, but she looked incredibly concerned 
And she said, look, it's a bit slow. You need to get out the water. So I got out and again, I'm still experiencing intensity. My body is still pushing. This is so intense. And she put the Doppler, she found it easier this time because she knew where to position it and the heartbeat had picked up. It was back to normal. So obviously maybe the water had just slowed it or whatever, but it was back to normal. So I was trying to be in more of a surrender mode because I was really hurting myself by resisting this pushing because now I'm having full blown conversations while my body is pushing with all of this intensity and it's very close together as well. Like I kept getting closer together. So I probably had like three pushes before the midwife got back to us and the midwife got back to us at 1 a.m. So this part, I was struggling to just focus, to have these conversations while dealing with intensity. So afterwards, Ian filled me in a little bit about that experience. And he said this was the time where he got like a bit angry and more assertive towards the midwife. And I think the doula did as well because she had picked up a slower heartbeat. She kept wanting to check the heartbeat. So I wasn't getting any time to recover because the recovery time she would want to put the Doppler to check the heartbeat and it kept coming back as normal. So Ian said to her, please stop, like stop that she can recover in between. Like you've seen now it's normal. And I was obviously like in, in a state of just trying to, <sighs> to, cope with with what i was experiencing so that was i guess the start of what i would refer to as the very dramatic part of my labor is there was a lot of debating that started to happen at this point and this was the debate of whether to go to the hospital or not so the midwife kind of brought up the hospital thing and i i wish she hadn't because I didn't want to spend energy and time thinking about transferring to a hospital. I wanted to be able to focus on my labor, but now the energy had shifted away from focusing on what I was doing to having a discussion. And I heard her say some version of you can't birth a baby through a four centimeter cervix, but my body was obviously pushing. So I got stuck on like, I can't do this. The baby's in a position where this isn't going to happen. And of course I could feel that baby was not in an ideal position because the pressure was so intense and it wasn't forward, it was back. It was a literal like extreme pressure towards my anus. And it felt like the baby was stuck on some kind of bone or something. So with the midwife saying that and the experience that I was having, I then started to doubt whether I could birth this baby. She kept wanting to do another cervical check. She was like, Hey, let's just check again. And I was like, get away from me. Like, don't, we're not doing that again. Like that, I think I wasn't very feisty in my labor. I, I don't think, but that I was feisty about because it was so painful to do that cervical check. The first time that I was like, just get away from me with the cervical checks. I don't want to do them. Anyway, one of the preparation things that I had done with our doula prior to birth, because you do a lot of discussions around your plans for birth, your preferences, your wide scenarios and so forth. So one of the things that I had asked of our doula is I said to her that I need you to find a way to keep me at home if it comes up that there the discussion of a transfer to hospital unless it is an actual necessity to do so like there is a risk not to do it or there is like a danger of not doing it if that's not the case I need you to find a way to keep me at home because it's very important to me to birth at home. All right, so that becomes relevant because obviously now we're having this hospital debate. And although the midwife is asking me questions, our doula realized that I didn't want to be having these thoughts. This is another thing that Ian said afterwards that he wishes he had stepped in more to say like, she's not in a state to be having this discussion with you, like stop it. Uh, because he said he knew we were on the same page and he, he could see how tiring it was for me to be participating in this like debate while going through what I was going through, where he said he wishes he'd stepped in more. But our doula said afterwards, like he was, he had stepped in when it was necessary and he, and he was really supportive. A lot of that part is a bit of a blur to me, to be honest, because at that point I was so exhausted and I was using every bit of energy to have this conversation as well as to experience what I was experiencing. So then I was like, you know what, fine. Like if you're saying I can't birth this baby past my four centimeter cervix and I need help, then okay, 
whatever, we'll go to the hospital. And so then the midwives are like, you know, this is not an emergency transfer. We won't go in an ambulance. Like, we'll, you can go in your own car. And like, I, I don't remember much of what she was saying, but I said to Ian, it's fine, like go upstairs and just finish packing the hospital bag and, and put the things in. There was like a list of things and I reluctantly had a version of a hospital bag because I didn't really want to go to the hospital. But I was like, can you just go upstairs and get it? And he was like very hesitant because he knew that's not what I wanted. and. But so he was kind of like, but he also didn't want to contribute to the energy that I was spending on having this freaking discussion. So he was like, a reminder, like, this is not what you wanted, but if this is what you want me to do, like, I'll do it. So I was like, just go upstairs, please just get it. And like, I'm tired of talking about it. <laughs> And then our doula said to me like, hey, you know what? Let's just go to the bathroom. Uh, she's like trying to get me away from this because I can't, I can't, like it's so hard to describe what was happening. It was like in amidst my body pushing and these intense back waves of stuff. I'm, ha I'm trying to have this like intense conversation about what are we gonna do, which I really didn't wanna be having. So I was like, okay, fine, let's go to the bathroom. I knew that she did that to get me away from the midwife, which I was grateful for. And I went to our downstairs bathroom, which is like, it's pretty tiny. It's just a toilet and a mirror. And while I was talking to her, I was moving around a lot and I started to put my leg on the toilet and just kind of shifting because the position was tough. Like it really felt like the baby's head was like on some kind of bone and it was like with every push it was like so much pressure pressure in my anus department like I was saying and I just felt like I'm pretty like I remember I, I remember saying this I remember saying that the baby's trying to come out my anus and like they're they're going the wrong way like that's it that's how it felt to me so standing in the bathroom uh our doula said to me like look if this is what you want, I'm gonna support you. If this is what you need to do, but like you've got this. And I don't really remember what else she said, but the energy or the theme of what I remember is that it was a big kind of like, you can do this kind of conversation and, and you've got this. And then the way that I had started to move then, you could tell that I was starting to lean into my intuition more of what I needed to do to birth this baby. So afterwards, when I met up with the doula, she said to me, you, you changed in that bathroom. Like, like the, the, the way that I was approaching labor or the birth, there was a transition that happened in that bathroom. That was the other thing that she was reminding me of, because now the midwife was saying that I'm so far off of giving birth where the doula was saying like, you're in transition. This is the moment and that was so important to hear even though i was still doubting myself because of what the midwife had said that i wasn't leaning into it and i know this that so many women want to go to the hospital when they're in transition because you think like if this is so intense i can't keep doing this for a long period of time and and usually when you're in transition you're not going to be doing it for a long period of time so you need somebody to remind you that and remind you that you've got this. And that's why we got a doula is I wanted to when I felt like I couldn't do it and I didn't know, like I wasn't trusting myself that somebody would bring me back to that. And that is what she did in that bathroom is bring me back to what I was experiencing and to remind me that I could do this when somebody else was telling me I couldn't do this. And I know the midwife was saying, you know, typically somebody wouldn't be able to birth a baby past a four centimeter cervix, but all I was hearing is that you can't birth this baby. So hearing somebody say, I can, was very helpful. So that bathroom is like, our lounge is there, you walk through the kitchen, and then the bathroom is there. On the way back, things really picked up. So I started to use the stairs because of the position. So now Ian had come down, hospital bag is on the table, the midwife is kind of still talking about, I don't know, like wh whose cars and what, I, I honestly, at this point, I wasn't, it was a blur to me. I don't know what she was saying. And I was using the stairs and Ian was like, listen, something is coming and kind of directed the midwife towards me. And I, I was on our stairs and our doula was in front of me. I remember she had the, the mirror with her as well, because some people like to use a mirror to see. I just remember vaguely seeing the mirror in amidst of what I was doing. And I was using the stairs to position my hips to try move the baby so that, well, I didn't know she was a she at the time, but the baby could come down. So when Ian said to the midwife, like, 
listen, something's coming. She turned around and she realized like that this baby is coming and coming now. So suddenly the whole like we're going to a hospital thing got put to bed. It was like this baby's coming right now. Okay, so now I'm on the stairs kind of doing a Captain Morgan pose there with my hips and I'm making all sorts of sounds. All sorts of shouting was happening for me. Like I thought that it would be one of those graceful people in birth, just kind of like breathing your baby out in your birth pool with like dim lights. Here I was on the stairs right by our kitchen, bright lights everywhere and I was shouting and some primal noises and all sorts. And the reason I was doing that is because it literally felt like my body was getting ripped in half. Like I felt like I was getting torn in half and it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. And I don't mean like I felt like my vag was tearing. I mean like my whole body as the baby was going down, it felt like my bones were getting like pulled apart and it was just, I was shouting all versions of like, get this baby out, I'm gonna die. I'm like, I, I don't care to remember the rest of what I was shouting, but it was a lot. And I'm pretty sure our entire neighborhood heard me. Like there was no turning the volume down. So at this point, what Ian had saw was essentially baby's head was pushing and Obviously the bits are swollen and they're stretching outward. That's what he had seen. So the midwife and the doula kept saying to me like, reach down, touch your baby's head. And I was like, no, I'm busy. And I didn't want to do that. Like I did like a half-assed attempt at doing that. But most of the time I just needed to focus on what I was doing because it was so painful. <laughs> and then I had always heard people say like, if they had really hectic contractions and whatever, often they don't get the ring of fire. So at least that part's not so bad or the pushing is not so bad. So it's not usually like, okay, you have really hectic contractions and then pushing is hard and then you have the ring of fire and, and, and. But I did. Oh my gosh, that ring of fire. So if you don't know what that is, literally like it's when your, your badge is stretching and it just feels like it's on fire. At this point, I remember shouting at the midwife to do something so that I don't tear. I don't know if she did or didn't do anything. I was like, hold it or yeah, just do something. I'm pretty sure maybe she put a cloth to it. But the other dramatic thing that happened here. So, I mean, I would deem that my birth story is a pretty dramatic one. Not, not in a bad sense, in a like... There's a lot of activity going on. So because the midwife thought that I was so far away from giving birth, she didn't call the backup midwife or she didn't, yeah, like give her a heads up that she might be needed. The reason they have a backup midwife, they explained this to me before that time, is that they need, according to their protocol, the midwife will tend to me and the backup midwife will tend to baby if there is anything that the baby needs when coming out. So at the actual birth, they want to have two midwives present. Now she couldn't get hold of the backup midwife. So they ended up calling 911. By they, I mean the midwife and Ian. And the midwife couldn't leave because now I'm on the stairs and the baby's gonna come out. So she needs to catch. And she kept telling me to come down because obviously babies come out like they, they go like with some speed and they're slippery. So I think she was scared about, you know, not being able to catch the baby. But I kept like, I was still maybe a little bit angry at her. So I kept climbing up the stairs, like away from her as opposed to coming down the stairs. And I really felt that I needed to use the stairs to position my hips such that the baby can come out. All right, so now Ian and the midwife are on the phone to 911. And I'm hearing them be very frustrated with the 911 call center person because they have to ask their like protocol questions. And they keep trying to explain like, we just need a medical practitioner pregnant. Like there's not an emergency, it's a planned home birth, like just come. Like, and they were like, you know, but you gotta stay on the line. And he was like, can I put the phone down? Like the baby's literally coming out now. Like don't wanna be having this conversation with you. <laughs> so that is for me both hectic because like, you know, while I'm pushing my baby out, they're on the phone to 911, but also a little bit comedic because they're getting so irritated with the guy having to ask these like protocol type questions on the phone. But nonetheless, that's happening. I think eventually Ian like put the phone just there because they had to stay on the line or something. And then the midwife was moving closer to 
catch baby. So here I am, a ring of fire, baby is busy, coming out. Head came and then literally like one more push, body came out and it was like the biggest, biggest, biggest moment of my life just in terms of utter relief, utter relief because the intensity with the phone call and the, the feelings and the burning and like the thinking my body is gonna get torn in half. All of that was like escalating. And then this moment, baby's born happened. And it was just so much more than I ever expected, probably because of the intensity. And I have never experienced such a, yeah, I don't, I don't have the words to describe it, like wonderful moment in my entire life. And what was extra wonderful about that was Okay, baby was born, midwife just passed her to me. I immediately saw that she was a girl and I immediately saw that she was alert and she was healthy and she was good, that I didn't need to worry about her. I didn't need to like stress about anything at that point. Like it was, it was done and I did it and <laughs> I was so tired. Anyway, I sat down on the stairs and just held her. So that's like the only photo we have. <laughs> of the, the major labor part, but it was like, what a moment. All right, so one of the reasons I didn't wanna know the gender of the baby, there were several reasons. One of them was I didn't wanna like extrapolate to the future. I wanted to just be present in pregnancy. I'll, I'll explain that some other time in more detail. But the other one was that I'd heard and read that when you don't know the gender, your baby's born, you have this like euphoric, feeling and then later when you check the gender you have another like wow moment which helps in the process of birthing the placenta so i had a little laugh internally that i immediately saw the gender as the midwife passed baby to me so i wasn't going to have that like second <laughs> moment although Ian did I, you know he only found out a little bit later from the stairs I walked to the couch oh let me mention this part so if TMI is not your vibe like really bodily functions is not your vibe don't listen to this part just like skip ahead a couple of seconds but because the pressure was towards my anus that means that your baby's coming out and they're pushing whatever is in your bowel is going to come out. So a lot of people know this, that you're probably going to poop in labor. Most people poop in labor. And you might think that you'd be shy about it or it'd be a big deal, especially like I burst on the stairs. So Ian was there behind me and the midwife and the doula in front of me. So here's my husband seeing, you know, that kind of view. I didn't care, did not care. It was so intense, I didn't have time to be concerned about what people are gonna think about that. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a very normal thing, but yes, that, that did happen. <laughs> and they just cleaned it up very quickly. So yeah, anyway, that was just a random part to add there. So I walked to the couch and as I was walking to the couch through the window, I could see that they had called off 911 when they saw, cause they were still on the phone to 911, when they saw that baby was fine. So they were gonna just wait for the backup midwife but I think they forgot to call off the fire brigade as, as part of calling everybody off. So as I was walking to the couch, I did see that they arrived and they opened the door. Somebody must have said like, look, we don't need you, it's fine. And then they, they just left. And then I sat down on the couch and I think a few minutes later, the backup midwife arrived. So discussions prior to the time is I opted for, what do they call it? I didn't opt for active management of the placenta or whatever. That's when they kind of give you an injection like while you're in labor to help with the contractions to get the placenta faster I said no to that I said let's see and part of the midwife's boundaries and parameters is and I knew this before the time is they said to me if you don't birth the placenta like we'll start to say something after 15 minutes but if you don't birth it after half an hour we're gonna ask you to transfer to hospital so I knew this obviously my doula also just reminded me that you can just say no to that but 
it was important that they expressed their sort of parameters of yeah what they were going to request of me so now baby was born but you still have the next big part which is the placenta a beautiful picture is at this point i was so exhausted and, and so dazed but ian shared 12 minutes after elba was born a picture saying you know we have latch because they had put her on the boob and she'd latched immediately and she was she really came out so alert and ready for life such a strong jaw like that ugh, was such a it was such a relief after everything so one of the things that i said when i lay there was i'm so happy to not be pregnant anymore and it feels like i've been pregnant for two years and the midwife i think they all gave a polite like smile to that and then ian reminded them that because of my miscarriages i was pregnant for very long before we got our baby and and they happened so soon like and like so close together and so close to when i had this pregnancy it was finally that moment that i had dreamed about for for so long all right so but here we are needing to birth the placenta now we were kind of waiting and then at 28 minutes the midwife said to me like listen it's been 28 minutes so usually she had said to me prior to that at 15 minutes she was going to start saying something like this and we need to try C or whatever but she didn't do that and I think it's also because of like how the labor had gone with just that it was a bit more unpredictable or it didn't go according to what she expected it to do that she just kind of left me alone a bit with the placenta stuff like wasn't talking to me much or, or telling me things so she didn't say anything at 15 minutes but at 28 minutes she sort of wanted to tug at the umbilical cord which I was like fine but i mean I'd, I'd read stories about that which uh, yeah i think i was just too exhausted to really say anything and it was like a gentle tug it wasn't gonna separate it but I, uh, yeah i didn't really like that anyway so now she was starting to get a bit like okay we need to get this placenta out and amazingly our doula had said to me you can see we definitely got so much value from our doula she had said to me one of the things that she looks for is like the the cord in terms of its i don't know it's it's coils and so forth because what sometimes happens is the placenta will detach and it will come down but it's still inside of you it hasn't come out yet but it's not attached anymore so all you have to do is stand up and then it will like come out so what i said to the midwife at that moment i was like look i know it's me holding it back because i'm afraid of the pain it was really really soft like it's so painful that i was definitely afraid of the placenta coming out so they were like it's fine it doesn't have bones and i'm like i know but and all of that just hurt like a lot so i said like just give me a moment to be okay with it coming out and i'll stand up i think she tried to say something else and the doula was like she said she's gonna stand up as in like enough interfering now so eventually when i got the courage i mean it didn't take very long a couple of minutes i stood up off the couch i think i passed baby to ian and my placenta fell out onto the floor and splattered blood on the people in the vicinity. I had a little giggle at that, but they were right. The placenta doesn't have bones, so it wasn't half as painful <laughs> as what I had experienced in labor. And then I lay back down, I think, or I actually, I sat on the floor while they did the umbilical cord cutting. So at that point, the midwife made sure to show us it was completely, completely uh, white. You know, it wasn't pulsating at all anymore. It was like 40 minutes or so after birth. Now Ian was doing the cord cutting and the placenta was done and I was just so exhausted. I sat back on the couch. The midwife then said to me, look, there's been quite a lot of bleeding. Can we give you an injection? At that point, I was so sick of making decisions. Like I was just so tired and I just looked at our doula to kind of be like, I don't know what I must do right now. Like typically I would just want to say no, but I wasn't paying attention to how much bleeding there was. So she just reassured me like baby's out, placenta's out. And, and the big thing for me was I didn't want any medical interference unless obviously medically necessary when baby wasn't out yet. So given that that was all done, I said, you know what? Okay, fine. 
like you can do it. I think it's an oxytocin injection. I, after birth, didn't experience like lots of people say they have contractions afterwards and that's to shrink your uterus back. I didn't experience any that, that I could feel. Lay back down and was in total bliss that it was over, but my story is not over yet because there's a couple of things that happen after birth that I think are worth talking about. And I knew that they were coming. So was like mentally prepared for it. But the the one of the things was to do the uterus checks. And they're they're like it's pretty sore when they're doing that. Like it's it's quite rough with the whole like fiddling with the uterus to check that it is shrinking back into position. So I hated it. The backup midwife did them and she was really great about it. Like she was the way that she spoke to me, it was very respectful and but it was it was awful. It was pretty painful. And then she just said like look your uterus isn't the shrinking back to where it needs to be just yet and it's probably because your bladder is in the way if you can try urinate felt like a really big ask but i definitely didn't want a catheter so because sometimes i use a catheter <gasps> to help okay. <clears throat> so i was like you know what okay it's fine i will try so they helped me walk to the bathroom mama. yes mama um so that i could try to go to the bathroom she just stood outside because i had the shakes after birth and lost a lot of blood just to make sure that i don't like pass out in the bathroom and i was pretty afraid to urinate i'm not gonna lie because my bits felt very bruised and very swollen but nonetheless managed to do that then the next thing was the midwife wanted to check any tearing and I was not overly excited about that. So I, I just want to say that after birth, Elba was on my chest. We were doing skin to skin the whole time, except when I stood up to birth the placenta and it, when I went to the bathroom and then this part of checking for the tearing. So she did the check. I mean, it's obviously painful having anybody touch those bits after what they just did. And then she said there are two tears. <laughs> One up, one down, big like concern, just second degree tear, so she wants to do stitches. So I said, okay, fine. And she then got the numbing injections, which pretty painful receiving the numbing injection. Then <gasps> they wait to see if it's working before <gasps> start doing the stitches. And it didn't work. Then I was reminded that even at the dentist, I don't have an experience of numbing very easily. Tried again, again, very painful. <gasps> Moving all the bits to be able to do the injection, didn't work. Tried again, didn't work. Tried again, didn't work. And at this point, midwives were discussing <laughs> what is the maximum like a numbing <laughs> amount they can give. And also like she was like running out of the numbing stuff to give as well. So they did reach the maximum. Uh, I think it was around 20 injections. Tried 20 times to, to numb it before it eventually did numb. At some point I remember asking like, can we just leave it? Like it's just so painful. Like can it just heal on its own? And they were like, no, we don't recommend that. So I was like, okay, fine. Even though, I mean, I have read that loads of people do heal perfectly fine without getting injections. But at this point I was just like fatigued and fine with it. Like we, we'd done so much already. So eventually the stitches were done and uterus checks were done and all of that was done. And I could just be on the couch in total bliss with my baby. What was really nice is the backup midwife got like warm water and a cloth and just wiped everything clean for me and they made sure that there was no blood on the stairs. They just kind of did a lot of caring things, helped Ian to let out the water from the birth pool, that kind of stuff. So I just lay on the couch with sweet baby Elba and they then stayed in the kitchen, like gave us our space. I think filling out their paperwork or just waiting a certain amount of time to check that all is good before they leave. I think our doula left around 5 a.m. and I think the midwives left at around like 5.30, 6 a.m.-ish. And I was very excited for everybody to leave, I'm not gonna lie. Like at that point, I was emotionally and I was physically exhausted, I was relieved, I was in total bliss and I was like, okay, now I want everybody out of my space. <laughs> Where I'm sure a lot of other people appreciate having people, I don't know, check up on them or be there to support. I was just excited for people to, okay, go away now so that we could just 
be our little family. And we stayed on the couch downstairs doing skin to skin naked for the first several, several hours. We did total skin to skin naked for the first 24 hours where I just used absorbent pads for all the bleeding and just cleaned up any baby messes that happened. That was very important for me to do. And it was only around 11 p.m. that night that I decided to walk upstairs and then start the official like 40 day period, which I did for the most part upstairs. And that is the general order of events. So just in terms of timeline is I had my mucus plug come loose on 40 weeks and four days pregnant. The bloody show happened midnight that day, 40 weeks and five days pregnant. At around 5 p.m. my water broke and then at 11 p.m. is when our doula came 20 past 11. At 12 at midnight, 40 weeks and six days is when our midwife arrived. And remember she left like shortly before 1 a.m. and we called her back. So she came back just, I think she got back just after one. And <laughs> Elba was born at 12 minutes past two at 40 weeks and six days pregnant. So all in all, from water breaking to Elba being born, I think it was nine hours. So you heard in the story a lot of the time, I was like, how is this so intense? If I have to carry on doing this for so long, it was so intense because I didn't have to do it for very long. It all, it all happened very, very quickly. Yes. But because it happened so quickly, it was, I wasn't surrendering to the process. I spent a lot of time in my mind, not a lot of time in my body. You heard that I doubted my body because of what the midwife said or checks, which I didn't really want to do initially, but that is what happened. And then I definitely aggravated my pain by resisting when my body started pushing as opposed to leaning into it. And for sure, the ring of fire, the tearing, all of that, I believe is because the actual birthing part with bright lights not in water this calm sense so a lot of it you heard me say was so incredibly painful and it was so incredibly painful because I wasn't surrendering to the process of birth I was in my mind I was like having debates there were like bright lights it was like so much talking happening that I wasn't focused on just being with my body and like what I was doing that all being said though the stairs for sure for sure for sure helped with the positioning because like I said, the pressure was backwards and I had had back labor the whole time. Like, I don't think I can tell you what a normal contraction feels like. I don't think I know what a normal contraction feels like. I only know what waves of back ache feel like. So because I had that, I really expected Elba to come out sunny side up, but she didn't. She did turn as she was coming out. Obviously we don't really know what position she was in other than what I was feeling, but she was born the, the usual position, you know, face facing backwards. And then based on the head shape, you know, it does look like she was probably stuck on some kind of bone or whatever, but the head shape does get squashed a lot as it's going out. She did have some like bruising on her face, but nothing major, just like a normal amount of bruising. It didn't like prevent her from latching at all. She didn't seem too uncomfortable by it. And, and a couple of hours later, the bruising was gone. The midwife did catch her because, you know, I was busy shouting all sorts of stuff on the stairs and immediately passed her to me. And then afterwards, she was just on my chest or on Ian's chest. <laughs> naked the whole time like having us feel her and then it was only like much later like i think 5 a.m ish where the backup midwife did her checks and then i was like right there you know touching her and it was in the dim lights of our lounge all very relaxed very peaceful so she spent like a few minutes <laughs> away from the two of us and then back onto my chest which was very important to us we did obviously have the delayed cord clamping of the placenta. I chose not to do a lotus birth. So I, I did want the placenta to be severed and they put it in the kitchen for us to keep. We had a funny moment where I just had to remind them to please put it like in the fridge or cover it up so that the cat doesn't get to it. 
the placenta was saved. Oh, and the backup midwife also did a placenta tour for us, which I found to be very fascinating, even in my exhausted state. It, but it's she needs to check the placenta to make sure that all of the parts came out. So she just showed, you know, where it was attached to the uterus wall and just where the umbilical cord is and all the parts of it, which that was pretty cool to experience. I'm trying to think if there's any other relevant information to share about the birth. So all in all, what I will say with my birthing experience is that for me, having a home birth was incredibly important. And I knew certain factors that would make that more or less likely. I just want to say that I am eternally grateful for the way that Ian and Ardula showed up for me in birth. They really showed up in the way that I had requested of them prior to birth and the way that we had discussed it prior to birth. And I'm just so, so grateful for that, that they were my biggest cheerleaders telling me that I could do this when I was doubting myself and when I was shouting all sorts of things on the stairs, you know, they <laughs> kept reminding me that I can do it and hearing Ian's experience of the birth was just also so beautiful where for him like just that that moment when Elba actually came out the fact that he managed to get a photo like he never remembers to take photos of anything the fact that he remembered to take a photo was amazing and he just said like he just laughed out of this like you did it <laughs> you actually did it <laughs> like our baby's here so it was like wow he was so exhausted after all that like he passed out on the couch shortly after the midwives left, <laughs> understandably. I didn't because, you know, it was just a rush of birth and everything. So that was just like amazing. And my birth group. So the last update Ian gave to them was when the midwife arrived the first time before she had left. And then people were asking what's happening. And that was around like 20 to one or something after she had left. So the birth group was like, ask how many centimeters dilated and what's going on? And then Ian just posted a picture of me and Elba on the stairs. And like the first response was my sister. I think she said like, no, stop it. <laughs> like in surprise. And then the messages that came afterwards, like reading those messages when I finally <laughs> got around to it was just the best thing ever. And I've read them so many times since then. And I'm just so grateful. What, that group was probably one of the best decisions that I made as well. Like there were a few decisions that I think I was like so valuable in my birthing process and that group was one of them. And one thing I do, do just want to discuss before I end off today's video is I spoke at length about how painful this experience was for me. Like I was in my head confused and I believe that's, that's why it was painful. And obviously it also happened very quickly and I was in denial about what was happening. I'm not angry about that. I don't have trauma because it was painful. Like in a heartbeat, I would do all of that pain and that intensity again for the total moment when she was born. I, I understand that women, including me, can be afraid of pain and afraid of the birth pain because you hear like how hectic it is and how intense it is. And what I just want to talk about with that was I wasn't actually afraid of the pain going into birth because I, I don't know, I just had like a faith that I can, I can take a lot of pain. And I love that because my birthing, I believe that our birthing experience is your ritual into motherhood. So it challenges you in ways that gift to us if we're willing to see that. So one of the things that it challenged me was I got up in my head not in my body and not like surrendered. And that obviously made things a lot more painful, <laughs> more intense. And the other thing is like, I was so confident that I can endure pain and that wouldn't be the thing that was like difficult for me in labor. Like I knew it would be intense and maybe I'd have fears, but I wasn't all that worried about pain. And how painful it was ended up being one of the biggest challenges for me to experience. And having now experienced it, and this is what I said to loads of people who spoke to me after my birth, is that I wholeheartedly believe that who you need in your birth space is someone who tells you, you can do this. Yeah. Not somebody who tells you, oh, there's a way to opt out of the pain. Somebody who tells you, you've got this, you can do this. Like the phrase, the only way to get out of it is to get through it. You need someone saying that to you. Like that is what our doula was, that was what Ian was for me is saying like, you can do this, you have to do this. And like, you've got this, you can take 
the pain. And that is very important to me because I didn't want somebody putting doubts in my mind. And obviously there were doubts that were in my mind, but I believe that it's important to experience birth in its totality if we can. Obviously that's what I wanted because I wanted my birthing experience to be the ritual and I wanted to experience and to feel all of it, even if it was so intense, even if it was so painful, which it was. And because mine was so intense, I really think the high of the moment when Elba was born, like, and remember, this was me coming out of four pregnancy losses back to back, being pregnant, moving to a new country, like not having my support system be there for me. I had gone through a lot to get to that, that point. And to have her be born, like, it was an indescribable moment of my life that I don't believe would have been such a high had I not endured everything on the road to that. So I don't wish away any of the pain that I endured or any of the hardship that I faced on the road to Elba coming to us. And to me, this was the ritual that I needed to send me into motherhood, to set me up for motherhood. And of, yes, it was painful. And I made loads of jokes that I'm so grateful we're into child spacing because like I'm not doing that anytime soon again. And yes, it was hard, but I don't think that we should avoid things because it's painful or because it's hard. And I didn't want anybody in my space giving me options to opt out of that experience. I wanted people in my space to say, you can do this. And that is what I got virtually and in person. In person in the form of Ian and Ardula and virtually in the form of my birth group. And those messages that they sent on the group were powerful. And a lot of that I think is lost in the modern world. A lot of it is lost where we don't rely on our fellow women to be our strength in times when we need it. We need to call up on the fact that I knew that my grandmothers had birthed all of their children unmedicated. I knew that my mom had birthed me and my sister unmedicated and I knew that I could do this and I, I had women on the group that had done it before me and had done home births and I had women on there who were just in awe of the process who knew what it felt like to face hardship and pain and they were all sending that wisdom and that energy through to me they knew what was important to me and they were supporting me in that and I am eternally grateful for that because that's what I needed. I needed when I felt like I couldn't do it to look up at somebody and have them say to me, you can. I needed those powerful moments in my birthing experience and I got that. The other thing that I'm grateful for is because I was in my house, I could use the stairs. I'm convinced that based off of the positioning that if I didn't use the stairs, like I don't know how that would have gone because they were the only thing that felt like it was helping with the position for baby to come down and to come out. So I am grateful for that. The, the, the debating with the midwife and all of that was difficult. And there are things that I would do differently in a future birth having had that experience. I wouldn't necessarily opt out of the use of a midwife. I think I would just be a bit more clear on what I do and don't want like in my space and like I expressed one of the biggest regrets for me was the cervical check and I don't have any hard feelings about any of that that happened there. What it was to me is a reminder to stick to what I know before the time and then say no to that stuff but also to remember that despite what other people say or do I have to be able to lean in and trust my intuition and like I keep saying birth to me is a ritual into motherhood and that is an important lesson for motherhood is people are going to have opinions and they are going to say things and they are going to place doubts in your mind. And you need to dig deep for your own intuition and your courage and be able to hear those things and then still do what you believe is best. So it's not that I shouldn't hear them. It's that I still need to trust myself while hearing the voices of other people. So I'm not 
really regretful of any of that because I believe that whatever my birthing experience was, those are gifts to me of beautiful things that I then took into motherhood. And I am so grateful that Elba was born at home because I am a homebody. It's my safe space. It's my comfortable space. I was so happy when everybody left my house and I was so happy that they opted not to come back later that day, that they only came the next day because that's what I wanted. I wanted privacy while being supported and I really feel like that's what I got. So all in all, I believe that my birthing experience was the perfect ritual into motherhood for me. Perfect gifts of reminders and lessons and definitely for me strengthened my faith in a woman tribe the way that I think we've lost in modern society which has also been so valuable to my motherhood journey and when i think back on that day i feel so cared for and i feel so supported and i feel so powerful and so strong and that's also one of the things that i took from that experience is that it was so hard it was so intense but i did it and I think that's also something you want to take into motherhood when you're feeling vulnerable and it's new and you might be doubting yourself is like I could lean on the fact that given how intense the birthing was I did it and I can do hard and I can do intense and I also think that there's so much power in that so like I said I wouldn't wish away the pain or the intensity of any of it it contributed to the total experience I had and I'm so grateful that Elba is here <laughs> and she's good and she's healthy and she came out so alert and so ready for life. Yeah. So yeah, that, that is my, my birthing story. Thank you that I could share it. Thank you for, for watching it. It was a life-changing experience and I'm eternally grateful that I, I got to, to have that experience and that I've had this beautiful, beautiful year with Elba.